tonight on different reasons why people fasted in the scripture, different, different reasons for us to fast. And then we'll take a glance at, at uh, what God says about what our hearts should be in the process of that fast. So, so that's kind of what's going on uh, tonight. Uh, upcoming events. So Sunday, we go to two services, 830 and 1030. Sunday at 1 o'clock, we will meet at First Baptist Estancia for baptisms. Okay, uh, and even if you're not being baptized, you can. Uh, we still would love for you to be there. Encourage those that are being baptized. Um, speaking of going to two services, always needing more help uh, around the church, and especially as we now go back to two services. So things like uh, kids' church, you don't even have to teach a class. You could just be a helper in class, looking for, for those, uh, looking for uh, greeters. Uh, we're looking for some folks uh, also that can help with cleaning ministry, um, looking for, uh, you know, just, just a number of different things. So, um, so there's those sort of things. Um, next Saturday, Next, not this Saturday, next Saturday is going to be the revival in the park. Pastor Chris was just talking about, um, you know, I, I hope that you'll be praying for that during this time of fasting. Um, here's the deal. And I, I just, it was something that I had said um, to, uh, uh, to a couple of the folks that have been real instrumental in putting this thing on. And, and I was talking to them Friday night about the revival. And uh, one of them was saying about like, oh, I hope I did this. I hope I did that. Here's the thing about revival. Revival is something that God does, not something that we do. And, and we could do some things to kind of prepare ourselves for revival. And, and in all honesty, even as we'll see in the, in the, in the various texts that we'll look through tonight, um, fasting, praying are good ways to prepare our heart for God to, to, to produce revival within us. But when it comes to the revival, this is something that God has to do. Now, now here's the deal. I am, a, I am a 100% firm believer, and I'll say this to Sunday morning during announcements too, I am a firm believer that God will bring those to, to, like when we do an event, when we do a concert, this revival, whatever, God will bring only so many people that we can care for. Meaning, if nobody shows up to the revival from our church to be there to, to, to pray for people, to encourage people, or whatever, then I don't think we'll get a big showing. And, it, and, and it's every single time we've done a concert, anytime we've done an outreach, whatever it is, the, the more servants that we have, the more people God brings that can be served by servants. Does that make sense? Okay, so, so I think that's just, you know, I think that's just kind of part of that. So I really encourage you guys to, to be there, to pray about being there, to pray through the thing. If for some reason your schedule doesn't allow for it, that's fine. If you can only be there for a bit of it, that's fine. It's from noon to five. There's, you know, you, you don't have to be there for the whole thing, but really encourage you to be there for that, all right? Uh, and then the last Saturday, really it's a Friday night and Saturday of September, uh, is the Southwest Men's Conference. Um, really, really great speakers, Ebo Elder. Um, that guy, I remember uh, the first time I heard that guy speak was at this conference. He's an ex-boxer, uh, world champion boxer, in fact, and uh, really am amazing testimony. Terry Gray, that pastors uh, Sun City Calvary Chapel there in El Paso. Uh, Mike McIntosh, our pastor, Pastor Ray, uh, or my pastor, Pastor Ray. I guess I'm your pastor, but that's my pastor. Um, I still feel like the junior, no matter what. Like, I've been pastoring 10 years, and I still feel like, you know, like, I don't know, like I'm just out here filling in for somebody else or something like that, <laughs> like I'm not the pro yet. Uh, and then uh, Pastor Sean, and then there's going to be breakout sessions. So there'll be Stand Firm breakout sessions, Stand Firm as youth uh, that I'm going to teach, uh, Stand Firm in your calling, Pastor Dion from up in uh, Española, uh, Stand Fast as hus or Stand Fast, or Stand Firm as husbands, Pastor Joseph Gross down in Silver City, uh, as Standing Firm as fathers, uh, Pastor Ray Montoya from uh, the Calvary Chapel out there on the west side of town, uh, and then uh, standing firm in sufferings, Pastor Andy uh, Fine up in Farmington. So um, really, I think it's going to be a really, really cool thing. So, um, so there's all of that, and that's kind of all I have by way, of, um, by way of announcements, probably more announcements than we needed. Um, let me do a quick head count, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, okay. Um, here's what we're going to do. Um, we'll take a um, we'll take a couple quick minutes. Is there anything in particular 
uh, that needs to be prayed for church-wide, because I'm about to print up a beginner list for you guys, just a, a starter list, and then you guys can jot down things that you want to add to that, okay? Right now, uh, as you know, I sent out a, a thing earlier today on Faith Life, uh, James uh, Garcia, uh, many of you guys know him, uh, when he does come, he sits in the back, his wife is Bernadine, they have their daughter Bernadette, and Bernadette has uh, some, some boys that, you know, her boys that she brings with her uh, to church. Um, I got called uh, Monday, and uh, was told that uh, James's left lung had quit working altogether. Um, he is, uh, that's causing the whole pulmonary system to go out of whack and work extra hard, so his heart is working extra hard. His right lung um, was told today, and I'm just sharing with you guys as the body, not putting all these details out online, uh, but uh, he's now on two uh, concentrators, two oxygen concentrators, trying to get enough, lung, uh, enough oxygen into the one lung. Uh, he has COPD, uh, emphysema, all of those sort of things, and uh, it has gone to the point now where they have, uh, you know, James has called for his family to come in. Uh, to visit him kind of one last time. Um, up until Wednesday um, of last week, he was still going outside, doing little construction projects outside. He had this cool little uh, barbecue area that he had been building out and all of those things. And um, he went into the doctor on Wednesday for a, for a test, came home, told Bernadine he just was tired and not feeling good. And uh, from that point on, has not gotten out of bed, has not eaten any food, uh, any of those sort of things. So um, on our list of prayer and fasting, I have James on there. I have Rosie as she's going through her, her cancer thing. I um, have uh, uh, Alex Orton's friend, Diane, with her cancer. Uh, some of you guys know Ron Fulfer, still on the organ uh, transplant list, uh, waiting for that. Uh, our friend, Pastor Frank, down in Socorro, um, we, we're still waiting. We've been waiting for, for, for about 10 years now um, for him to... Uh, to be ready to walk again, to get out of his wheelchair. And we're, we're still trusting that God's going to do that. Um, and then we have some other things on the list. But is there anybody in particular I need to add to this list for healing, just for healing, that's church-wide that we need to pray for before I print this up for everybody to have a copy of? No? Okay, I'm going to send this off for printing, and we're going to get into our, our uh, study. Thank you. That should be enough. All right. Let's start in Ezra, chapter 8. Ezra, chapter 8. Let's, let's, I'll be praying as you guys are turning there. Father, would you, um, would you just do a work in us tonight, Lord? We, uh, we come, some of us, uh, certainly understanding the, the great depths of, of things going on around us and within us and, and a need for the body of Christ, the church, to fast. Some of us come in here just, just sort of looking around and saying, man, I, I wish the, whole, the sanctuary was full of people to begin fasting with us. And we understand, Lord, that some will be fasting and just unable to be here on a Wednesday night and... And all those things, Lord. But, but God, we, we, we recognize through various events that have taken place, even, even the, the weirdness of things that took place on Sunday, God, that there is a need for your church, your body to be fasting, to abstain from the things of the flesh, to abstain from food, or perhaps abstaining from phones or, or media or wh whatever it is you call us to abstain from. But God, that, that we, need to, um, we need to abstain from the things that are pleasurable to the flesh, that, that we might not be distracted by those things. And instead, God, that we would desire a closeness with you, desire a word from you, desire your favor upon us and upon our church and upon this valley, Lord. Upon our nation even. Lord, we, we recognize, God, that things are not all good and great and, and all of those things. But rather, God, we recognize we need you to intervene. Some of us, God, walking more closely with you than we ever have. And, and God, we want to walk even more closely with you. 
Some of us ha- have been distracted by, by life in general, by the busyness of things, and recognize that we need to set some things aside so that we could spend time with you. Some of us unsure as to whether or not we're even able to fast. Just, just I don't know, Lord, can I make it? And, and God, we call upon you to give us your grace and to sustain us during the fast, Lord. And more than that, not just to make it for a couple of days of not eating, but that we would grow close to you in that time, that you would draw us near to yourself and that you would speak to us, God, that you would give us a word, God. We, we need you. Father, we, we need more from you, Lord. We need you to do a work within us. And so, God, here we are, begging you, seeking your face. Would you please do something, God? Bring healing where healing is needed. Bring encouragement where encouragement is needed, God. Bring a word where a word is needed. Bring strength where strength is needed. But God, do something in this crazy spiritual battle that comes with following after you. Do something. Intervene on our behalf, God. And God, as a result of this fast, would you please bring personal revival to us? And God, prepare us for a great outpouring of your spirit, Lord, that we trust that you want to do. So God, would you speak to us tonight? Would you, would you do with us whatever it is that's needed tonight? We trust you, and we desire you, and we need you. We ask all these things, Father, by faith in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, prayer and fasting. Uh, One of the Christian's least favorite things to do is to fast. And that's because fasting, though it's called fasting, takes a really long time. You never realize how much time you have on the clock in a day until you realize that you're not going to be able to eat for at least a couple of days later. You know, it's, it's uh, yeah, if you want to start handing those out, you can. Um, that, that's, that's one of the hard things about fasting is that, you know, it's this discipline that's lost. And part of the reason why the discipline is lost is because, in general, discipline is lost. Disciplines, in general, for people in America, for people within the church in America, are lost. We're not a very disciplined people. And so when the pastor says, you know what, we're going to have a church fast— Some of us go like, oh, that's great. And some of us go like, oh, no, I don't know about a fast. And some of us go like, you know, then then some of us who grew up sort of like, uh, well, I don't know. I grew up Catholic, right? So sometimes we treat fasting like Lent, you know, and it's like, I'm going to give up beer for my fast. Like, well, maybe maybe a little more than that. Maybe a little deeper than that. You know, I'm going to give up candy bars. Maybe you could go a little further than that in seeking the Lord. Maybe there is something that that really you can, you know, fast from in seeking after the Lord. And, and I'll be honest with you, wh- while it while I understand that sometimes you can't fast from food, you have to recognize something that when you look at the Bible, there is no other fast other than a no food fast. Like you just don't eat food when you fast, biblically speaking. And I get it. Some people have medical things going on. Look, my mom is one of those people. She cannot fast from food for an extended period of time. She can do that. She has some medical things going on. So she finds something else to fast from. For some of you, I don't know, maybe you have nothing but salad and no meat. Maybe you, you know, I, I don't know what it is that you're going to do. But we're, but, but, but we are doing a church fast. And here's the crazy thing about it. I put it on the calendar starting this Wednesday just on a whim. And I know that sounds crazy, but I was just like, okay, you know what? We need to do a church fast. Boom, we're going to do it here. And then we had the women's retreat and, and, and then all the crazy stuff that happened Sunday. And, and when we met for prayer Sunday night, there were so many things coming in, text messages and all of that, that it's like, what in the world is going on? And it was as if the, you know, the gates of hell were like rattling as the enemy was just furious at what God was doing. So I think God put this on the calendar at this time for a particular reason. Now, fasting happens for a number of reasons. Maybe some of you are just waiting for a word from the Lord about direction in your life and one thing or the other. Time of fasting and prayer, 
scripturally speaking, that could take place. Maybe some of you are praying and fasting because you really genuinely just want to get close to God. Maybe some of you are praying and fasting because you're seeking his provision and, and you don't want to make your, your, your need necessarily known to others because you'd rather see God come through. Wh wh whatever you're praying and fasting for, you just never know. But I can tell you this, in our home, mostly from Leanna's fasting, not mine, you know, some, some really interesting things have happened as a result of fasting. And, you know, call it good or, or not good. I'm not, not really sure what, what you would call it. But uh, when Leanna fasted the first time uh, as an extended fast, she fasted for 40 days, and she got me. We got married. There was that. So uh, I don't know if that's good or bad. Um, the next time she fasted for 40 days, we got pregnant with Rama. Nobody's asking you to do a 40-day fast here. This is just a, you know, a couple-day fast. But God does intense things when we say, I'm going to abstain from the things my body and my flesh craves, and in place of those things, I'm going to seek after you. Now, now here's the deal. This is only a two-day fast, and I'll be the first one to tell you that I believe fasts are only successful if God calls you to that. And yet somehow at the same time, I believe that there is a time when God calls individuals to fast for a time. And I believe that there is a time when God would call a group of people, a church, to go and to fast together. And, and, and God has to be the one that sustains that. And, and here's the deal. You're going to get hungry because guess what? Your body gets hungry, right? So when you get hungry, what do you do? Then, then that's a great time to start praying. And not just, like you might, when, I, when I'm fasting and praying, when, when, when I'm fasting and I get hungry, my prayers really start out a lot like this. God, I'm going to die. If you, I, don't, I need to eat food, Lord. I don't think I can make it, God. I don't know what to do. You know, and, 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 and then I'm crying out like, God, you got to sustain me because like, I'm never going to make it through. You know? and, then, and then I look at, the, at my clock and I'm like, oh, I, I've, I've been up for 35 minutes. We, but we need to be disciplined in our faith. You, you, when, when you get hungry, spend some time in prayer. Spend some time feasting on the word. Spend some time in that. And there's a lot of reasons that people fast. There's a lot of reasons people in the Bible fast. I'm going to go through a few of those tonight. In Ezra chapter 8, Ezra had called a fast as he was leading the children of Israel back to Jerusalem. He was given permission just a couple chapters earlier by King Artaxerxes, given a letter to go and given permission to go back to Jerusalem. But upon examining the people in, in verses uh, 1 through 14, it shows the genealogy of those who returned it from the exile back to Jerusalem, back to the homeland with Ezra. And, and when he goes through that, you'll see verses 15 through 20, you'll see that what, what happens is that all of a sudden, as Ezra goes over and, and looks down the list of the people coming, he realizes that there were no Levites that had come along with them to do the work of ministry in the temple. And so after, after sending for a Levite, they, you know, for the Levites, they get a Levite, a single Levite to come along. And then he proclaims a fast there because he, he, he wants to make sure that God's in the midst of this thing. Look at what it says, Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 says, and I proclaimed a fast there. Here's Ezra calling for all of those that are heading back to Jerusalem to fast together. Nobody woke up that day and thought like, you know what, I should fast. Ezra called the fast. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all our goods. Because I was ashamed to ask the king for a band of soldiers and horsemen to protect us against the enemy on our way, since we had told the king that the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is against all who forsake him. So we fasted and implored our God for this. And God listened to our entreaty. He listened to our request. There's, there's a time for the people of God to get together and to fast and to pray and to seek the Lord for something way bigger than what man can provide. And in this case, notice the, the heart of Ezra. 
And I think about this as I consider just the great spiritual warfare that, that seems to have really ramped up in the last couple of weeks in general for us as a church and, and really for the church in general because other pastors I know, you know, dealing with very similar things. But, but notice that, that, that he calls a fast there in verse 21 that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from God safe journey for ourselves, our children, and all of our goods. Like, God, I, I, I need you to provide safety for us. You have to realize that as Ezra and these, and these Israelites are going to go back to Jerusalem, they're going to be going through territory that, yes, it's, it's, it's run by King Artaxerxes, but, but without having soldiers and all this stuff, it is the word of a few Jews against a bunch of pagans who already don't like the Jews. And, and if God doesn't intervene for them, they're going to get killed along the way. And Ezra saying, you know what? I'm not going to ask the king for any soldiers or for any horsemen. Why? Because I just got done telling the, the king how awesome God is, how the hand of our God is for good on all who seek him, and the power of his wrath is, is against all who forsake him. Isn't that interesting? Ezra goes, dude, I got to put my money where my mouth is. I just got done saying that God is going to protect his people, and God will deal with those who are against him, and, and then... Now what am I going to do? I got all these people and we got to make a long journey from Babylon all the way back to Jerusalem. And how are we going to do that unless God intervenes? And, and look, quite frankly, as I was kind of thinking over all this, this was the very first text that came to mind for me when I thought about what I would talk about tonight as far as prayer and fasting goes, how, you know, what I'm going to teach or whatever. Because I, I look at this and I go like, man, if God, if God does not do something for us, we're all toast. And, and, and I don't mean like, you know, we're all going to lose our lives or any of those sort of things. But, but look, I, I don't know about you, but I'm very, very aware of an intense spiritual battle taking place in, in, in the realm that the eyes do not see. And if God does not come through for us, if God is not the one that comes and gives us a safe journey for ourselves and for our children and for our good, our goods, th th then I don't know what we're going to do. We're going to be toast. The enemy wants to pick us off. You know that the, the enemy walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. He, 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 he steals and kills and destroys. That's what he does. And we need God to do a work. On our behalf, as, as we seek, you know, the, the, the Lord, as we seek his good upon his favor, upon this church and upon this valley, God has to come through and God has to be our protection. Again, I, I, you know, Sunday morning, just out of nowhere, we're praying next door in the annex right before service there. And, and I just started praying like, Lord, would you just send your, your angels to come and do battle in the unseen places over the events of this church today? And what happened? Like, man, we needed that. Had some weird dude show up that had to be escorted not just out of the sanctuary but off the premises. Like, Henry had to load the dude in his car and drive him clear to Moriarty. Like, get out of here. That's how intense things were. Can you imagine if God wasn't for us in that? Can you imagine if God wasn't gracious to us in the middle of that? Well, other reasons why, why guys, you know, why the people of Israel fasted in, in, in the Bible, you, you can go just a few pages over to the book of Nehemiah. And if you remember, Nehemiah fasted when, when he heard about the ruin of Jerusalem's wall and the gates that were burned with fire and because the city was open to a constant attack by the enemies of God's people. And Nehemiah wanted to know, like, God, how uh, will you use me? And if so, how will you use me? Look, look at just the first three verses of Nehemiah 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. And by the way, that would be those dudes that we just read about when Ezra fasted there in Ezra chapter 8. And they said to me, 
the remnant there in the, pro in the province who had survived the exile is, is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, verse 4, I sat down and wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. And I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel which we have sinned against you even I and my father's house have sinned we have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments the statutes and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses remember the words you commanded your servant Moses saying if you're unfaithful I'll scatter you uh, among the peoples but if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell well there they are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand O lord let your ear be attentive to the prayer of me your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man now i was the cupbearer to the king what's the deal there why 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 is nehemiah fasting and praying because he heard that his people were, were, were wide open for attack. He heard that the wall was fallen down and the gates were burned with fire. And what was the cry? God, remember your promise that, that yeah, if, if, if we disobey you, you'll scatter us out. And God, you have scattered us out everywhere. But your word also says if we return to you in our hearts, that you'll take care of us again. And what does he do? He starts confessing his own sin and the sins of his people. Saying, God, we really messed up. We really messed up. But God, you're really good and you're really gracious. And you'll receive us back and you'll take care of us. Don't, don't you love that heart? And, and if you do love that heart, do you have that heart? Do you, like seriously, during a time of prayer and fasting, do you know the beauty of being able to go like, Lord, I know a lot of people personally, whether they be in this church or outside of this church, God, they have strayed away from you. I don't know what's going on with them, God, but they've strayed away from you. And, and your word says that if they would, if anybody comes to you and confesses their, their sins to you, that you are faithful and just to forgive. So God, would you do a work and draw people back to yourself? And God, would you bring protection about them? This is beautiful heart of Nehemiah. And what does Nehemiah do? He puts the, the prayer into action later in chapter 2 when he goes before the king. And the king goes, hey, what are you, what are you so sad, sad about? This is nothing more than sorrow of heart. You know, and he goes, no, 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 long live the king. Like, the king lived forever. There's no, there's, I'm not, there, I, there's nothing wrong with your food here, king. I know I'm the cupbearer and all that. It's not that, but, but my people, King, my people, they're, 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 our, our city, Jerusalem, lies, lies in ruins. And, and, and the king says, what do you want? And Nehemiah knows that the Lord's favor is upon him and that the Lord has heard his prayer. And he goes, king, I want to go back and go rebuild the wall and put up the gates. I want to do something for, for, for the people of God at the house of God. Like, man, what a reason for us to, to pray and to fast together that God might do something on behalf of his people and on behalf of his house. Well, after Daniel's visions in, in chapter 7 and 8 of the book of Daniel, he began a fast in, in, in chapter 9 as he was seeking clarity from God while also confessing his sin and the sin of the Israelites. And, and during that fast, God responded there in, in, in Daniel chapter 9 with giving him clarity for the visions that he had seen in chapter 7 and in chapter 8. And, and, and then on top of that, look at, look at what happens here. This is, this is phenomenal. In chapter 7, in chapter 6, you have Daniel going into the lion's den. Then in chapter 7, Daniel gets the vision of the four beasts. Uh, he sees the ancient of days ruling and reigning. He sees the Son of Man has given dominion. That's speaking of Christ, Jesus. Then he gets an interpretation of the vision. 
Then over in chapter 8, he sees the vision of the ram and of the goat and all of those sort of things. And then an interpretation of that vision there in chapter 8. But then in chapter 9, Daniel begins to recognize that if all these things are about to take place, because this talks about the destruction and, and one kingdom and another kingdom coming and, and, and destruction for God's people, then in chapter 9, Daniel begins to pray for his people. And again, he begins to confess his sins. He begins to confess the sin of the people. And as he gets done doing all this, or rather while he's in the process of doing this, fasting before the Lord, Gabriel shows up with an answer to the prayer of, of, of Daniel. The very last couple verses uh, of that prayer. So well, let's go back to verse 17 of chapter 9. Now, therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant. And to his plea for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary which is desolate. O my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolation and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O Lord, hear. O Lord, forgive. O Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O my God, because your city and your people are called by your name. And look at what it says in verse 20. While I was speaking and praying, while I was in the process of calling out to God here, confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my plea before the Lord my God for the holy hill of my God while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, Gabriel always comes and brings news of, of, of Messiah, whom I had seen in the vision at the first came to me in swift light at the time of the evening sacrifice. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, O oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you insight and understanding. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out, and I have come to tell it to you, for you are greatly loved. Therefore, consider the word and understand the vision. And, and then from there we have from, from verse 24 down to verse 27 that that. That, that incredible passage of the 70th week of Daniel. The 70 weeks that are laid forth. But how did that start? How did Daniel get one of the most important scriptures, the most important words given in the entire Old Testament regarding the, the, the Messiah and the last days? It started with him fasting and praying and seeking God. And, 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 and I get it, right? Some of you are like, yeah, but man, I'm not Daniel and I'm not. No, no, but hang on. Da who is Daniel? He was some teenage kid that got taken from Jerusalem to Babylon. And God just so happened to have favor upon him. Here, here's the thing. Here's kind of the point I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm making here that I, I hope you're already getting without me having to state it. But God does stuff. When we say, Lord, I, I want more of you, and if more of you means i got to have less of the things that, 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 that please my flesh or less of the things that, that my flesh craves, if it requires me fasting and praying, then so be it because I need something from you. Let, let me, like, seriously, let me ask you a question. Is there anybody in here tonight that feels like they, they have gone as far as is possible for them to go in their relationship with the Lord. Is there anybody like is there anybody here that like wants or needs something from God? Because I that's me. Like I man, I want more from the Lord. I need more from God. Like th let me ask you this. Is there anybody here that can identify or or acknowledge that our little church in the middle of nowhere needs more from God, yeah. right? Like we do. These things come when God's people fast and pray. And, and look, let me be perfectly honest with you. I don't like fasting. I like the result. I don't like the process. I don't like fasting. I like eating. All day. All day. I snack all day long. I like to eat. I don't like to fast. I don't like to fast. Guess what? Right? There you go. And that's what you might have to do. 
You might have to just say, like, I'm locking myself in my house. Because here's, here's what I've discovered. Do, exactly. I have discovered that no amount of water or juice takes the place of a meal for me. My, my wife is far more disciplined than me. My wife can, can drink a V8 or something, and she's like, you know, she at least appears as if like, oh, that's just as good as a, you know, as a sandwich. Me, I'm like, a V8? Give me the whole six-pack. I'm starving. <laughs> but, can I, but, but, seriously, but seriously, can I tell you that, like, I want and I need more from God than I want and I need a sandwich? Like, I need more from the Lord. Fasting is kind of a, a reset for us. It's kind of a spiritual reset button for us. And we, and we need that. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go on to a few more examples. In, in, in Joel chapter 2, just after God reveals the horror uh, of, the, of the, you know, the, the coming of the day of the Lord, then, then you, then, then, you know, in the, in the very last days and, and, and all of those sort of things, in Joel uh, chapter 2, in those first oh, 11 verses, you see the day of the Lord there. In, in verses 12 through 17, you see the return of the Lord, and, and then you see how God has pity. But the interesting thing is the return of the Lord is found there in verses 12 through 17. And, and the crazy thing is, is that God calls his people to fast there in Joel chapter 2. And then what follows that, verses 12 through 17, it, is that you, you see down in verses 28 uh, through 32, you see that great, amazing promise that God would pour forth of his Holy Spirit in the last days. And guess what? That section there, verses 28 through 32 of Joel chapter 2, is the same thing that Peter quotes on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 when he gets up and he says, these men are not drunk as you think they are. It's only 9 o'clock in the morning. This is what God promised back in Joel chapter 2 when God said that he would pour out his spirit. But before God brought that promise, God first made a, a great warning of what was to come in the very last days, in the days uh, of the Lord. And then in verses 12 through 17, look at this, Joel 2 verse 12, yet even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with all mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God. Why? For he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over distress. I'm sorry, over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even the nursing infants, let the bridegroom leave his room in the brighter chamber between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord weep and say, spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations, why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Look at, look at what God calls the people of Israel to do, the children of Israel to do, to, to fast, to weep, to pray. God calls there in Joel chapter 2 for the, for the leaders, the leadership of the church to beg God on behalf of his people as they pray and as they fast. It's incredible. And again, you know, verses 18 through 27, then you see that the Lord had pity upon him. And then that great promise uh, of the Holy Spirit that's going to be poured forth in the day and age that you and I live in called the church age. But then there's some other really cool stuff that happens in the scripture when, when, when people are fasting. Turn over to Acts chapter 13. And I know, like, we're moving around a lot tonight. It's a good, good opportunity to see how how well you have been learning your Bible over the, over the time of studying it. Of course, some of you just, you know, hit a button on your phone and you're there too. But Acts chapter 13. Look what happens as the leadership of the church in Antioch are, are together fasting, worshiping the Lord. Look at Acts 13 verse 1. 
There were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers. The, the church is gathered together, but there are those with the gifts of, of, of prophecy and teaching. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menain, a lifelong friend of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now this Saul is Saul of Tarsus, whose name is going to uh, is changed to Paul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Now that doesn't seem like such a big deal, right? Like, all right, so they were worshiping God and they were fasting. They were just fasting and worshiping, fasting and worshiping. And then the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul. By the way, a uh, little side note here. This is the only time that you see Barnabas' name show up first, I believe, before Saul's name. And then after this, you'll always see Paul and Barnabas. And here's the interesting thing about this. We read this and it's like, okay, so, so the Holy Spirit said, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work I called them to? Do you know what the work was? That, that, that the Holy Spirit just separated Barnabas and Saul to? This is Paul's first missionary journey. This is how Paul gets the call on the first missionary journey. And Paul is going to take three missionary journeys, taking the gospel all over the, 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 the globe, in a sense, in, in, in the, the regions that he's able to travel by ship and by foot. God is about to turn the world upside right through, through this guy, Paul. And how did it start? They were worshiping and they were fasting. They were just seeking the Lord. Like, Lord, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? What do you want to do with this, Lord? We just want to know what you want to do with this, Lord. Lord, here we are. Send us, God, whatever you want to do with this, Lord. And then, the, and then the Lord speaks and says, okay, Barnabas, Saul, I want you guys to go to the work that I've called you to do. Evidently, Saul and Barnabas had already been praying and already been seeking some sort of confirmation about taking the gospel elsewhere. And, 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 and again, little side note, can you imagine how terrifying it must have been for Barnabas and Saul to know that they were about to just set sail and just go from town to town telling people about Jesus, not knowing what's going to happen. Saul had no idea how tough this was going to be. You, you, you look and, and they go on to Cyprus and, 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 and then uh, Pisidia and all of that. And, and right away, what happens? Paul ends up getting stoned in one city. He's got to be let down out of a basket because people want to kill him. Like he had no idea. And yet God, God did one of the most incredible things through, 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 through Paul. Who then, of course, wrote uh, 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 you know, more of the epistles in the New Testament than any other person. And then, of course, when it comes to fasting, we know multiple chapters of Exodus uh, record the account of Moses fasting during 40 days and 40 nights as he's up on the mountain getting the, the law from God. We know that Jesus fasted just before his temptation from Satan for 40 days and 40 nights, before entering this time of public ministry. But I think with fasting and with all the stuff that God could do, I think there's, there, there's a warning about fasting that's found in the scripture as well. Isaiah chapter 58 is probably the most stern warning on the topic of, of fasting, of being hypocritical. Isaiah 58, we'll go through the first 12 verses. Verse 13 and 14 deal a little more with the Sabbath in particular. God is dealing with the rebellious people in Isaiah 58. He's dealing with the Israelites who have been very hypocritical. And God says this. He says, cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression. Now, this, the whole thing is interesting because it would seem that all of this is something that Isaiah has seen in a vision and then writes these things down. So cry aloud. Do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to my people their transgression to the house of Jacob, their sin, yet they seek me daily and delight to do my ways. Now, now here's the thing. God isn't saying that that's what they're doing, that they do seek him daily and delight to know his ways. He's saying that's what they say they do, but that's not what's really going on in their hearts. Seek, they seek me daily and, to, and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the judgment of their God. 
They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. And then look at what he says. God quoting the people. Why have we fasted and you seen it not? Why have we humbled ourselves and you take no knowledge of it? Behold, in the day of your fast, you seek your own pleasure and oppress all your workers. Look at what he says in verse 5 or, or verse 4. Behold, you, only, you, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to hit with a wicked fist. Fasting like yours this day will not make your voice to be heard on high. Isn't that interesting? God says, don't be playing games when it comes to a time of fasting and prayer. This is a serious, serious thing. Like, you know, if you want to play games, then just don't even fast to begin with. But don't be fasting and calling upon my name and telling everybody how you're calling upon me and seeking me and all this stuff when really you're just acting as wickedly during the fast as you are without the fast. Just because you're doing it outwardly, just because you're just not eating and still, you know, being wicked, that, that counts for nothing. Look at, look at what, what, what God says. Look at verse 5. Is such the fast that I choose a, a day for a person to humble himself? Is it to bow down his head like a reed and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Will you call this a fast and a day acceptable to the Lord? Will you just do the outward stuff? Because here's the thing. We could fast all the wrong way. We could abstain from food and have no desire to seek after the Lord at all. Look at what God says about the fast that he chooses for his people. Verse 6. Is not this the fast that I choose to loose the bonds of wickedness? To undo the straps of the yoke? To let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house when you see the naked to cover him and not to hide yourselves from your own flesh? Then shall your light break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up speedily. And righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Do you notice what God says there about fasting? He says, no, 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 do it my way and, 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 and look at what it is that I want. What, what God wants for a fast is to loose the bonds of wickedness. For the chains of darkness to be broken. To undo the straps of the yoke so that people can go free. That the oppressed could go free to break every yoke. That, 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 that people would be set free. It, can, can, let me put this in the perspective of the New Testament. That people would be set free in Christ. Because he who the Son sets free is free indeed. And look at what he says. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover them and, and, and not to hide yourself from your own flesh, the idea being like, no, 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 part of your fast, it should be that your, your heart is changed again and you show mercy. What, what, are the, what do the lawyers say? Well, you know, they came to Jesus and said, hey, you know, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. But the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. This should be the result of us spending time with, with, with our Father. He says, then your light shall break forth like the dawn. It, there should be enlightenment and illumination in our life as we, as we get closer to God and, and abstain from the things of the flesh. And your healing shall spring up speedily. Isn't that interesting that your healing shall spring up speedily? Some of us are in need of healing. Whether it's those of us in the room, and certainly some of us in the room need some sort of healing, but there are folks within our fellowship that need healing. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. What, what happens as we, as we commit ourselves and dedicate this time of fasting and prayer to the Lord? Righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Look at what he says, then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, here I am. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and speaking wickedness, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. And the Lord 
will guide you continually and satisfy your desire in scorched places and make your bones strong. And you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters do not fail. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations and shall be called the repairer of the breach and the restorer of streets to dwell in. God can accomplish incredible things as we fast and as we pray. Now one last little little word regarding the way that we're to fast and pray comes from Jesus there in Matthew chapter 6. Over in verse 16. Jesus wants to make sure that it, that it counts. You have to realize that the Pharisees would fast two days a week, Monday and Thursday. That represented the, the day that Moses went up on the mountain, the day that Moses came down from the mountain. And, and the idea is, I fast twice a week, Lord. And, you know, they, the, the Pharisees would say, I fast twice a week, and I, and I give my, my alms and, and all this stuff. Look at, look, at what, look at what Jesus says about fasting for us. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. When you're fasting the next couple of days, don't be out like ladies. Don't break out the makeup all dark, you know, <laughs> you know, all, all real pale. What's the matter? Are you sick? No, I'm fasting. I'm fasting. I just... I'm just so spiritual. I'm fasting. Jesus says, you, you start doing that, walking around all, oh, I'm fasting. Well, guess what? You got your reward already. Your reward could have been the Lord, but your reward is that now you got the pats on the back of other people saying, oh, wow, you're so spiritual, you're fasting. Look at what Jesus says, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Anointing the head could be it's taken two ways in the text here. It could be anoint your head with oil as you anoint somebody and pray for them. Or, or it could just simply be like, you know, not everybody got to take showers there, so they would use oil in, in place for, for the stink. So like, you know, take a shower, fellas, put on cologne, you know, and, and go about your day. Like you don't, 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 you know, uh, do the whole... Everybody look at me, I'm fasting thing. He says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You see, fasting isn't just some outward religious thing that we do. Fasting can be done when we're seeking God's direction in a deeper way. A little side note. I remember when I taught through this chapter, I discovered this, even though I don't really like this to be the facts, this happens to be the facts. It has been shown that a full belly slows down the blood flow to the brain, but an empty stomach causes mud, more blood flow to the brain. Empty stomach can mean clarity of thought and concentration. It can also be something we, we do to help in the spiritual battle of life as we find ourselves struggling with things of the flesh. You're having a constant struggle with an issue of the flesh. And take some time to say no to the basic needs of the body's need for food and to pray instead of eating. The Lord will work out his strength in you over the struggles of your flesh. God can do a great thing in our lives when we fast and pray. Or we can lose the reward and fast in front of people. And be the hypocrite like Isaiah 58 warns against, like Matthew 6 warns against, so that they applaud our good religious behavior. Now, it's not to say that we're not allowed to tell somebody we're fasting. The heart of the matter is who we're fasting in front of and who we desire to get the glory in our time of fasting. If God does a great work in us, then he gets the glory. If we walk around looking all malnourished and pathetic, then man will give us the glory for the hard work we're putting into our spiritual life. So I just kind of just kind of closing, I, I think it's a valid question. Um, 
and you don't have to answer it out loud. I mean, you, you need to, you, I'm sure you've already determined this with the Lord, but what are you going to fast from? And, 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 and here's the deal, like make it count. Don't treat it like, like at least, you know, me and my family treated Lent, you know, when, when, when we grew up, you know, it was always something superficial. It was always something like you could easily live without anyway. What are you going to fast from? Like what's going to, what's going to actually, you know, what's, what, what's going to hurt you to fast from, I guess is the only way I could say it. And I, and I don't mean to put it, you know, that negatively, but what do you, what's going to hurt? It's going to hurt you to fast from. I, I know it hurts me to, to fast from food. That, that's what I'm going to fast from, fasting from food, because I hate doing it. I absolutely hate doing it. Some of you, food's not a big deal, but maybe social media is or whatever. I don't know. But what are you going to fast from? And then not only what are you going to fast from, but what are you going to be fasting and praying for? I gave you a basic list of, of stuff to start with. But it's, it's meant to be an open-ended list that you add things to that list. You know, the Lord's going to speak to you. The Lord's going to tell you what to fast from. I have, I have plenty of other things on my personal list that I'm, that I'm praying over while we're fasting that I didn't include in that because that's my list, not your list. This is just a general list for, for, for our church to be fasting and, and, and praying for, okay? So, but but it's, a, it's a good question, and I really want you to, to think about that tonight. You know, and and when when you wake up tomorrow, whatever it is that you choose to fast from, it's going to be obnoxiously hard tomorrow. It just is, right? Like, here's the deal. I typically could go until, like, if I'm working, doing something, I can go until noon or 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock or 3 o'clock or 4 o'clock and not even eat. I'm just busy. I guarantee you tomorrow I'll wake up bright and early, earlier than normal, hungry. I will. I'm ju- it's just going to happen. Every Wednesday night after I get done teaching, you know what I do? I go pig out before I go to bed. That's what I do. As soon as church is over, I'm famished. Doesn't matter. Sunday morning, I'm hungry. Wednesday night, I'm hungry. Tonight, I guarantee you I'm going to be extra hungry. I'm going to be extra hungry. I'm going to be like, dude, oh. And, it, and it, you, yep. And and here's the thing, you can't let those thoughts run away. With you can't let your mind run away with those thoughts. Instead, you got to go. You know what, Lord? I need something from you. And and I got to tell you this too. Just this kind of last thing before we 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 pray together and end here. Um, fasting doesn't always feel like a super spiritual thing. You, you know what it feels like. It, it feels like um, it, it feels like you're just reminded about the stuff that your body craves. Like I, I don't. I mean, from what I hear in a very in, a, in an extended fast, that's when it starts to feel super spiritual. But oftentimes you don't realize what God was doing in the fast until you've broken fast, and then you go, oh. So, like. You know, I'm I'm just I'm trying to be very plain and, and simple in warning you, but it's yeah, it's gonna be hard. It's not easy. Fasting's not easy. And and probably you're just gonna discover how weak your flesh is. And then when the when the when the fast is over, then you'll go, Oh, that's what God was saying. So hold in there. Don't give up. Don't give up. Okay? Don't give up. Let's pray. Father, thank you. For loving us, thank you, God, that um, that you sustain us, whether you sustain us in the day-to-day by feeding us or whether you sustain us in a time of fasting by, by giving us grace to get through the fast. Lord, there's a lot of things on every single one of our personal lists. And Lord, I pray that we would be Diligent in this time of fasting, God, to seek after you and to trust you for these things. And God, that you would sustain us. That you would not allow our mind to be overcome and overwhelmed by the things of the flesh. But instead, Lord, you would, in a very particular and special way, draw us very close.
close to you. And that you would accomplish great and amazing things. God, spiritually speaking. For those that need healing, God, I, I, I think even right now, Lord, of James and Bernadine and Bernadette, their kids, the rest of their family. God, I just I pray for them that you would do whatever it is that your will is to do. And God, in the midst of that, that they would sense your presence. Lord, as we fast, as we pray, would you, would you shake the ground, shake the heavens, and produce an amazing result, Lord. Not that we would boast about the fact that we fasted and prayed, but that when it was over, we would give you the glory for every good thing that you have done. Father, we love you, and we thank you, and we need you. Sustain us during this time, God, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Yes.